So thank you all for uh, joining. Uh, this is Jesper Brandbeck uh, from Health Tech Hub Copenhagen. Uh, we've had 106 signups for this event, so we're very, very intrigued. So happy to see so many faces and so many uh, names we know. Uh, we, we, we thank you for spending the time the next 90 minutes with us, and we hope we can keep you engaged and hopefully also inspire you a little bit about what's going on in health tech in Denmark and around the world. Uh, we will have many different speakers today. Uh, I hope you have already grabbed a good cup of coffee or some water or whatever you need to stay tuned. We will have no breaks, so you have to take the breaks yourself. Uh, we will re record the video, uh, this thing, because uh, we want to make it public available for others who are not able to attend today. So I hope you're all fine with that. You are, please, if you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, please put them into the chat window uh, where you can ask all the questions. We will try to ask, uh, answer uh, as many as we can as the time permits. Uh, and if we do not get to answer your question uh, in, the, in the call, we will get back to you next week with uh, answers to your comment or question. Okay. We will also throughout uh, the events have a few questions, links, surveys sent in the chat window. So it, it, it might be a good idea to open your chat uh, box as well so you can uh, see that while we speak. In terms of the agenda, uh, I will uh, first, very soon introduce Thomas Hoffman Bang, the CEO of the Danish Industry Foundation, uh, who will speak to us a little bit about why they've supported us and uh, what's their perspective on health tech. Then I will then I will speak a little bit about how we see the Danish market around health tech and what the status is like. Then Mette Dürber, our chair of the board of HTSC, will be live from New York, where she lives and runs a startup, where she's the founder of a startup called MyMe, a health tech startup, and she will give us an international perspective uh, from New York. And then we will have four of our uh, founders from four of our different startups here who will share perspective. We'll have Robert from Cerebro, Ulrich from Injury Map. Theodor from Linus eHealth and Thomas from Incenso. And then at the end, uh, we'll have my dear partner Valentin share his thoughts and views on how, where we see the future of health tech. So we hope that this will be an interesting afternoon for you and a, a great way to start the weekend. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Thomas. Uh, please uh, take the word, Thomas, and I'll make sure that you're not muted. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Yes, please go ahead. You hear me? Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Um, great, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to to speak today. Um, I would like to basically uh, touch upon two uh, agenda items. And a basic introduction to what is the Danish Industry Foundation for those of you who might not know what that is. Um, and then, of course, why did we engage in the uh, in the uh, Danish uh, health tech hub? Um, um, and, and thereby, how does that fit into to our strategy and our focus? Uh, and how do we do we read the the uh, the environment around that? Um, so first, a few words around the Danish Industry Foundation, where we are one of the large uh, foundations, uh, philanthropic foundation in Denmark, uh, with, a, with a capital base of, uh, of close to 5 billion Danish kroner. And our mission is to enhance competitiveness of the Danish industry. Uh, um, and we do that basically uh, with a focus on the Danish SME uh, sector uh, and on a focus on the startup uh, community and the whole thing around innovation and entrepreneurship, and 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 clearly uh, the the establishment of the uh, of the health tech hub fits into to the second group uh, where we have a, uh, quite a few uh, activities uh, going. The way we operate is 100% is through donations, uh, so we do not invest, we do not uh, grant loans, but we, we grant uh, money to generate knowledge uh, and, and 
uh, uh, fostering uh, startups is uh, is how we operate and and what is that and that's our our success criteria uh, on that basis why did we in the create a strong ecosystem uh, around entrepreneurship, around startups. Uh, and we have very good experience with the, with the hub uh, format where the, uh, the, the, before the health tech hub emerged, uh, the uh, coping fintech hub uh, was, uh, was a very good example of, of how that can be done. And we have a I approached as a health tech hub, it was um, fast jumped on that idea uh, to uh, to support that, um, and uh, we also did that because we believe that there's a great opportunity in this space uh, where the combination of a, a, a large and, and well functioning uh, healthcare sector in Denmark, combined with the fact that we are one of the most digitalized uh, societies in the world, uh, and we have a a, a pretty okay uh, uh, startup community and, and entrepreneurship spirit in the in 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 Denmark. Uh, the combination of those factors we felt was uh, was was the right uh, basis for for, um, for for doing this. And we have also for quite some time been engaged with with the question around how do we. How do we capitalize on the on the strengths that we have, uh, the ones I just listed, um, and how do we once for all crack the nut? How we commercialize all the healthcare data uh, that is laying around, and that's been a long discussion for yeah probably the last ten years. How we how we get going capitalizing on healthcare data, um, and the meaning is that we need something special to to facilitate that development. And among other initiatives, we believe the health tech hub is a very important factor in driving and pushing for, for that uh, development. So we, did it. Uh, so we, uh, we have uh, uh, granted uh, 23 million uh, to the health tech hub, uh, which uh, really enables the, the, the health tech hub to get started um, and ensure uh, operation for for the the first uh, three four years I guess it is um, and therefore really providing the platform for Jesper and the team to uh, to to uh, to get this going and and hopefully show you know uh, in terms of agenda. We will get out of our engagement, um, and um, and with that, I think I will I will pause. So back to you, Jesper. Yes, thank you so much, Thomas, for these these words. Uh, thanks a lot for this perspective. Uh, then then I will then I will share a little bit about how we from Health Tech Hub Copenhagen see the perspective. Uh, I see, see the see the state of health tech. I was talking a little bit about what's behind HTHC, as we call it, Health Tech Hub Copenhagen. Uh, I'll, it's also our birthday. It's a one year ago we had our CVR number, so we will look a little bit back in terms of saying what have we accomplished, and we'll look at, at what the market is like now. You know, what is the, what's going on, and so what are the key challenges? What keeps the startups awake at night? Uh, we'll share a little bit about that with you guys. So in terms of Health Tech Hub Copenhagen, our, our first goal has been to break the adoption bottlenecks in healthcare. We all know that, especially in the traditional healthcare sector, we have had huge bottlenecks. And this is one of the key issues that we, that we want to help the solve in Denmark and help the startup solve and the industry. Our other big ambition is to improve health and reduce health costs for 1 billion people worldwide. So that's our overall and very long-term ambition. To, to do that, uh, we have uh, we've come, up, come up with five accelerating forces for the health tech ecosystem. 
and 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 our DNA is basically our startups. We focus on on uh, on helping and accelerating startups since we believe that they have the innovative ideas, capabilities, and agility needed to produce the new and needed health tech solutions to serve the one billion people. However, most startups cannot do this by themselves. They need to work with patients, hospitals, regions, doctors, insurance and pension companies, universities, patient organizations, etc. Therefore, we also need to spend time creating relationships, collaborations, pathways for collaboration, co-creation and adoption. Denmark, as Thomas also mentioned, has a very strong existing life science industry. Denmark's in this industry in Denmark contributes alone with 18% of Denmark's export. However, the industry is not very digital. We need this industry to become uh, yeah, more digital. Many startups lack access to global marketing, sales and distribution. And therefore we work hard on establishing connections with startups and the existing industry. We also want to attract talented global solutions to Denmark to serve the Danish citizens better. Lastly, we are very aware that funding is the biggest issue for startups within health tech, and therefore we are also working on raising a fund. So that was a little bit about us. Then what have we done the first year? Uh, with the help from many people, we have achieved quite a bit. And uh, I need to first thank Industrians Fund because without them, we would not have existed. And without the help from Dansk Industri, uh, Danish in uh, Confederation of Danish Industry, Roche Diagnostics and Net Company, our commercial partners, we have not been here today neither. So they are all uh, very much the, fund the economic fundamental from what we are doing and also a great help in the daily life of the hub. We also have 15 members of, uh, of the hub, uh, most of them physically in the office, a few of them virtually, we have one from Dubai, one, one mostly from Aarhus, but we, uh, and one from the Netherlands as well. So these are our daily friends. Uh, however, we also help uh, hub members or, or startups across Denmark who are not currently in the hub. Obviously, we need to speak about COVID-19. Uh, when COVID-19 hit the world and just a few days before Metafolixen decided to, to close down Denmark, we decided internally that we had to do something around this. Uh, we skipped all our other plans, our engagements, and we, we said, hey, we need to find out what, what solutions are out there, what health tech solutions are out there who can help in this regard, who can help Denmark and can help the world. So we made a global call out for, for solutions that could make a difference in, COVID, in the COVID situation. And, and we did, uh, we researched what was what's happened in other pandemic situations, and we basically produced uh, a needs-driven health tech solution. We, we uh, sorry, a catalog with, 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 with solutions that were needs-driven, okay? So we had more than 138 solutions submitted uh, from across the world. We had a team who was working almost day and night for three weeks, analyzing, interviewing, uh, taking references. And we made these two catalogs that we shared with both the Danish Ministry of Health, the Danish regions, uh, also the NHS in the UK, WHO and others. Uh, we've also looked, uh, suddenly there was a word that uh, we'd not heard before, personal protective equipment, PPE. We talked a lot about that around the world. However, we also realized from use cases around the world, from Israel, from uh, Far East, and even from Italy, that, that personal protective equipment is not only physical equipment, it could also be health tech uh, solutions. So we also did a lot of research and spoke to many startups and researchers around what, what solutions are out there, what solutions do we actually have in Denmark that it could help in this regard as well in terms of protecting the healthcare staff, which is more most of a risk. And we did this catalog and you can see the catalog and the links to the catalog in the chat window where you can download them if you have not seen them yet. Um, 
Lastly, uh, just this week, we've just publicized these two uh, magazines, or uh, magazines, uh, brochures, if you can say. And they are a result of uh, the foreign ministry. They donated some very old respirators to Italy and a million euros. And we, we reflected on that and we thought, hey, we can do better than this. You know, we, Next time we are asked by a country somewhere in the world that needs help with COVID or another pandemic, uh, we believe that we should donate, donate some of the best technology we have in Denmark. So we, together with our friends at Healthcare Denmark, we, we scanned the market for solutions who could help uh, countries like Italy, like Spain, and other countries that were in a higher demand, a higher need than we were in Denmark. Uh, so we now have these two catalogs. They're also available, and there will be a link to them in the chat window as well. Right now, we are working with the foreign ministries, the trade councils to promote them around the world. And hopefully, this will lead to some export and maybe some donations in the future as well. A birthday also calls a little bit for a for review of what has happened the last year. And, uh, and, and we, we, have, we, we have been fortunate to have many uh, good results. And one of the things I'm, I'm personally mostly proud of is the community that we together with the startups have created, together with our partners have created. We have truly created a community of people, of startups that, that act as a community. And when I say community, what does that mean? Yeah, it means that we have uh, we just uh, took account on our coffee machine this morning, and we the last five and a half months we've been drinking more than thirteen thousand cups of maca in our kitchen, and over some of these cup of coffees, there's been exchange of information, exchange of knowledge, exchange of ideas. We I, I personally witnessed two startups meeting each other for the first time over lunch and making a business collaboration just after lunch. Uh, I've also just a, a week ago saw two founders exchanging a term sheet, uh, which could save the other startup a lot of time. So these kind of things is uh, what gives us a kick at Health Tech Hub Copenhagen. In terms of growth, uh, one of our startups are now in 80 hospitals serving more than 200,000 patients. Another startup has grown from 10 employees to 50 employees and are still making money. We are together, all the hub members, reaching 750,000 users with the health tech solutions from the hub. That's still a bit up to a billion uh, people, but we're getting there. Uh, we've also been able to facilitate a, a collaboration. And one, of our, one of our startups are in talks with a large corporate about a global collaboration, and that has been facilitated by us. We have also, as we said in the beginning, we, we, we need to have good relationships. So we have spent some time creating good relationships with key stakeholders at the Danish regions, the Danish industry, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, hospitals, research institutions, and many other stakeholders. We have had two hub, hobbies, as I call them, got US patents approved. One had had a CE marking. And we have recently, oh, not recently, throughout the year, joined three international health collaboration networks. We've joined EIT Health, Health Tech Nordic, uh, and Hacking Health. And we believe all these three collaborations can help the Danish startups uh, with their export and their globalization. We also see, we've also seen a huge buzz in the media. Last year, there were 1,000 articles written in the Danish written media about health tech. Uh, and my inbox daily gets an overview of the articles that are published around health tech, around our, our startups. And I must say, you guys rock. So what else about the Danish market? Uh, what have we learned and what can we see? We have recently uh, publicized this uh, a magazine together with Burson here in March, where we produced the first uh, dedicated health tech magazine. It's a physical magazine. If you don't have it, we have uh, quite a few more copies here in, in our office. So next time you come, you can take a pack, uh, copy with you, a physical copy. But there will also be a link to the magazine in the chat. So you can download it yourself. You cannot wait to get the physical copy in, in this magazine. Uh, there are many great articles uh, around many startups and about what the industry is thinking and acting around on health tech. And one of the things, one of some, some of the key data points which I want to share is that, hey, we have a pretty good, impressive growth in employment. You know, over the last four years, 
We've had uh, more than 136% growth in number of employees, and we've also seen almost 70% growth in number of startups. So, hey, the industry is starting. When we started, there was no, there's not a way you can ask Denmark Statistic or any other industry organization in terms of saying, hey, how many health tech startups are there in Denmark? And actually, we did not know last year, or even a year ago, how many there were. We knew the ones we knew, but we didn't know all of them. So we started, uh, built a database. Uh, we did a lot of manual uh, Google searching and other, other looking in many different directions. And now we have a database of, I would say, almost all startups within health tech in Denmark. We have 182 startups in the database now. We have divided them into disease areas uh, and even sub-disease areas. We know exactly uh, how many employees they have. We know what the annual accounts like is like. We know how many investments each company have received, if it's a, a public available information. Uh, and we are tracking this now. And we are tracking this because we also want to know which market are you currently, uh, these start are you as a startup serving? Which markets do you want to move into? Because we want to, when we get a, for example, an ask from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that, hey, we have this seminar about entering the U.S. market, then it's important for us to be able to, to reach out to the, the startups who want to go to the U.S. Uh, so we use it for this. We also use it for, we have many VCs from around the world who comes to us and say, hey, I'm a Japanese VC. I'm interested in mental health. Which startups do you think is looking for money and it's interesting for us to meet? And then we set this up. Uh, set this up. When we look at investments, uh, then the investments has been pretty slow for the, the, the from 2015 to 2018, around 50 million krona in equity investments. However, when I say equity investments, it, I, I, I have to say as well, in this industry, as mo most of you know, we also have lots of soft money investments because the soft money, there are quite a few uh, places where you can actually seek soft money. So my personal, and we've not estimated properly, but my personal impression is that there's probably as much uh, soft money as there's equity investments as well. However, last year we, we had a very good year. We had uh, 200 million uh, in, in investments. And this year has also proven pretty good, especially the first two months, January and February and early March. We had 50 million in equity investments at the startups, and we even had an IPO of QLife on another 40 million. Uh, so, and this is actually also very um, similar to other international trends. However, as well, when we look at the investments, we can also see that there are no uh, Danish VCs that are very active. So the biggest deals are done by uh, German VCs and, and UK VCs. And that's one of the reasons that we want to have a Danish VC that focuses on this to keep some of these, uh, some of our great startups in Denmark for the long term. Yes, in terms of the key challenges from a startup perspective, we have we have surveyed all the startups uh, that is that is existing. We have uh, emailed everybody, surveyed and called and spoken to uh, 56 respondents out of the 180 startups that was in the database when we started. Uh, and and the message is very clear: what keeps startups awake at night is funding, funding, selling, and customer adoption. Uh, and we spoke about funding. We're definitely trying to do something about that ourselves and also obviously facilitating other VCs to meet the relevant startups. But selling and customer adoption is a key challenge. It's a challenge around the world, and this is uh, what we are working hard on. And these challenges, we are... Oh, I missed the... I dropped the presentation. Uh, can you see? Uh, I, I just upload the presentation again. Just a second. Sorry about that. Uh, you're almost there. So here we're back. Sorry about that. Uh, technical glitch. 
So we're using these challenges to basically to to uh, to prioritize our activities and priorities in our team. And we will keep asking you uh, what are your challenges, and we'll keep doing events and activities around these challenges. In terms of COVID, hey, this is the big thing right now. Obviously, COVID has impacted uh, almost all of us. Uh, it has had a huge impact on many people, people and businesses around the world. From a pure health tech sector perspective, we see the following impacts. Funding was difficult before, now it's even more difficult. However, that we also see more soft money from foundations like the Nobel Foundation uh, and other foundations. We also see great programs from Innovationsfonden, uh, more gearing and loan from Vexfonden, and you will see a link to a, to a, a webcast that Dansk Industry, Danish Industry, did last uh, this week with some good presentation from both Innovationsfonden and Vexfonden. If you're a startup, you should look at these things because there are money to be um, seeked here. We see product development for some companies that are product development for the companies that are dependent on hospital staff in terms of the co-creation, then it's, uh, then, it's uh, then, then, then product development is delayed, of course. For more consumer oriented, they, then they don't have an impact. In terms of sales, it's also a little bit different, you know, what we, what we hear. For some, it's faster. For some, it takes a little bit longer, especially the ones that are, have more complex deals and, uh, that are, and, and, that, and that needs to travel to other countries to, to close these deals. Obviously, people are very creative and having online meetings and online sales things. And, and generally, and I have to say that, generally people say this is uh, sales, sales demand is looking very good. I spoke to one of our startups yesterday and they said they had two times more new customers under COVID than they normally have. So, uh, so if if do you also see that you will have more demand? So, so we we base, basically believe that that the health tech sector as a whole will have more demand for uh, for the solutions uh, going forward. Please, we have a small survey in the chat window as well, where you can say what you think as well, and we'll be happy to hear your thoughts as well. And have you already experienced more demand? Then also please respond in the survey uh, next to it. We also see uh, that, that healthcare uh, organizations, uh, hospitals around the world and also in Denmark have seen faster deployments. You know, we've, we've seen how even in, uh, in, in Denmark as well, we've embraced telehealth. We've talked about telehealth for a long time. And now suddenly you can have a teleconsultation with your doctor anywhere in Denmark. We also hear stories from hospitals, from GPs, that they actually had a good experience. Of it. Hey, I could actually treat a patient through a tele remote monitoring session. Uh, we also see a more a need for around personal safety. That hey, we can use health tech to improve the uh, the safety of our employees. And from a consumer perspective, uh, we see how video consultations have exploded. I just saw some numbers yesterday from Sweden. They are. On, gone through the roof and also in Spain. We still have not seen the release numbers in Denmark, but I'm sure worldwide they are exploding. Uh, we see online coaching and apps also having really good traction. And obviously these contact tracing apps that will also soon launch in Denmark have uh, interesting uh, traction. So politically, uh, the last nine months, all politicians have talked about the climate. Climate is very important. But since March, health has been the first priority. I believe that we see a new expectation for healthcare. We need to digitize healthcare. And the consumers want it, the society needs it. We need it to, to control pandemia, but we also need it to reduce costs in general and increase the care of the patients. I, I, we truly believe that we have a window of opportunity now a unique window of opportunity for our industry, uh, and 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 I hope that we will all together embrace that opportunity. So that was my words. Now I will hand it over to Mette to give her a little bit of a perspective from live from New York. So please, Mette. Hi, hi everyone. So yeah, this is a little bit of an early bird special here. Um, 
they, they used to say that if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And with COVID, this has never been more true. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very different reality at the moment. Um, my usual saying is I'm from Legoland. I'm extremely proud of being Danish, and I'm super excited to see the potential of Danish health tech. Um, I started in health tech um, as a senior trade officer for the Danish foreign ministry back in, God, 2000. Um, and then my own health brought me back to digital health tech six years ago. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Miami. We are rethinking autoimmunity. Um, Miami was conceived after years of feeling frustrated by the healthcare system, both in Denmark and in the US, um, that simply did not understand the nuanced challenges of autoimmune disorders. Um, traditionally, autoimmunity has been seen as 157 different diseases based on where the body was being attacked. Uh, we as a company are asking a diametrically different question, why? And that addresses the underlying mechanism that allows us to pinpoint triggers. Um, so MIMI is a clinically validated program that helps reduce symptoms by identifying and eliminating dietary, environmental, and lifestyle triggers that are causing your immune system to overreact. Uh, through the use of a mobile app, data analytics, and a personal coach, we find the triggers and symptoms and then we use human power to help translate the machine findings into doable behavior changes. Um, being this is the US, our customers are payers and self-insured companies. Um, and the, the ROI is really, everybody's talking about quality of life, but the reality is we're selling on a reduction in ROI. Um, what makes Miami really cutting edge these COVID times is that we actually work distributed way before the virus. Um, I actually don't know what you call it in 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 other terms, but you know, distribute just means that you are working um, from a lot of different cities uh, across the, the country, um, and the pandemic has really forced companies to do the same. Um, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey came out this week and and told employees that they could work at home forever, um, and that changes things in many ways, right? Because it doesn't make sense to work from home and then travel to a doctor's appointment. And just as Jesper has outlined, you're seeing in Denmark, we've really seen the effect of COVID-19 uh, on accelerators and incubators here. Um, we are personally, we are part of Johnson & Johnson's J-Labs in New York. We've negotiated a 75% rent reduction. You could say, you know, we're paying for nothing. That's gonna be closed at least till August now, but uh, most incubators don't have long lease agreements with their tenants. So we just see a lot of empty buildings and it's definitely going to reframe uh, the way we work and live. Um, but the pandemic has forced this massive shift in the healthcare industry and not least how patients interact with providers. In January, it was less than 20% of healthcare organizations had a virtual care program in place. And it's estimated, you know, about 70% of all of these could have done with telehealth. But the barrier was the payment model. You get what, you know, I think four times as much for live compared to a virtual session. So in the US, the, the barrier has existed primarily around reimbursement and coverage. Um, and that's where this crisis has really done the most sort of disruption. We've seen major shifts in the reimbursement landscape. So, um, clinically validated tools coming to the market um, are really only up against this one barrier, who's going to pay for them. And what that has resulted in is that with the increasing concern for people's mental health, the U.S. agency, so the FDA, has relaxed their, relaxed their regulations. And so if you're treating disorders like anxiety, depression, insomnia, there is a immediate infect guidance document. It basically means that whereas the US in the past has been a very hard market to enter, you can literally start up in 24 hours if you have a product available to the end uh, consumer. Um, there's obviously a lot of concerns amongst you know, the more some traditional market around flooding um, the market with these non-validated solutions and 
What I believe is that it puts the onerous on the digital health companies to really separate themselves from uh, consumer products. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Um, the one thing, though, is you can't unlearn something. So if, from where I'm sitting, the, the biggest difference is really that as, you know, you know, for example, in rheumatology, which is our sp sp field, these specialty providers saw 0% virtually uh, clients in January, and now it's up to 98%. So once you've started uh, skipping the, the commute um, and you've seen that it works, uh, you're going to request this in the future. So from where I'm sitting, we can't go back to the old broken healthcare system. And we believe here that there will be a lowered resistance to these virtual care solutions. But we also can see that there's already been a major shift from sort of fee from service to value-based care. It's something that has been talked about in the US for more than a decade. And nothing has really happened because there was no incentive for anyone. You know, this the system here is a little broken in the sense that everybody was making a lot of money by having a broken system. Um, but when payers are squeezed due to all these COVID expenses, they will look at solutions through a very different lens. And we believe that if it maps to the high cost drivers, um, there'll be a market. So I think what we're seeing more than anything here is that regulating technology is almost happening at the speed of the virus. So um, it's an exciting time. It's definitely uh, unprecedented in every way you could imagine. But um, from, from where we are looking at it, there's only good things to come. Um, it's hard to say that in the midst of everything, we are still, you know, I have not seen a human being since March 11 when I returned from Denmark, um, which sort of seems crazy when you live in New York and you're used to the, the colorful ways of, of this city. Um, but on the other hand, we've never been busier. Um, we are now in a position as a company to be speaking to, you know, Pepsi and Disney and all the companies that that typically would not be looking for um, these alternative solutions. So I think for the Danish companies that are ready, particularly if they're in the mental anxiety insomnia space, uh, there's never been a better time to access this market. Um, I, it's my belief that we will come out stronger and that digital health will win. Um, and, you know, I, I, I almost um, keep going back to regulating technology at the speed of the virus, but it really is because in this system, as much as adoption is valuable, it does not bring the solution to the end user unless the payment system is fixed as well. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of what happens on this side of the pond. So last but not least, um, thank you so much, Jesper and Valentin, for all the work that you've done this past year, and happy birthday. Thank you, Mel, and thanks for your perspectives. Very, very interesting to hear what's happening in the U.S. market. Thanks for that. Of course. Now I will uh, we'll do something pretty courageous as well. We'll, we'll give uh, four founders uh, five minutes uh, each, which is difficult, uh, but we'll time you. Uh, uh, time you. And the first founder is Robert from Cerebro. Uh, we have basically asked these three, uh, four founders for, for three different questions. So what, is your, what was your best decision during the last 12 months? What didn't work out? What did you learn the most? And what did you get out of being part of HTHC? So Robert, please start. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jesper. I hope you can hear me. We can. And, and thanks yeah. also for sharing about uh, your US experience. I think, uh, I, first of all, I'm, I'm Robert Lowertz, and I'm, I'm actually using Ulrich, who's sitting next to me at social distance, his computer. So it's it's stating Ulrich on the on the computer, but I'm, I'm Robert. I'm the CEO and, and co-founder of uh, Cerebro. We are a, uh, a medical imaging uh, AI company. 
working uh, initially now with brain MRI and with hospitals, uh, mainly from Europe and India, but also actually discussing with several hospital systems in the US. So it's it's interesting to hear these uh, these uh, reimbursement perspectives. However, our business model is more oriented around sort of healthcare provider, health economics, um, and and you know productivity gains. But let me talk a little about you know the past twelve months since, uh, or actually we were we were. Let me start from the beginning because we were actually founded in July uh, two thousand eighteen, and and fairly shortly after met up with uh, with Jesper, and thought it was a brilliant idea to support uh, creating a health tech hub that would actually create critical mass uh, to support the kind of journey that we were on, but also uh, bring a, a, a better network for us to work with and, and be inspired from and inspired to on that journey. Um, so we were very happy to move in with uh, the health tech hub uh, back then in, in the end of, of uh, 18 and, and be there in, in 19. And, and then it was finally formally founded a year ago, which was a great celebration that it could actually happen. And thanks for Industrians Fund and and uh, Net Company and Rush for supporting uh, that part of the business as well. So so in the meantime, we have been developing. We pivoted basically when we when we created uh, the company because uh, we had started out in the dementia space, but wanted to help out radiology. And and it seemed that it was great to do with research, but but it didn't really help the routine clinic. So so we've been through a journey pivoting, changing, figuring out how to build a business in, in something that is a long, slow, painful exercise to make a clinically validated mature product that is, is fit for use and fit for purpose uh, in a hospital system. Uh, most that talked about that we talked with when we started the company and along the way with investors say that it takes probably at least five years to 10 years to make a strong med tech company. So it's it's you really do have to have patience and resilience to get there, but uh, but we had a good journey and we we uh, we actually were lucky to get not just good hospital partners in uh, in uh, in India and Denmark, but also now in Norway and are meeting up with hospitals in, in other parts of Europe and and in the U.S. that really buy into the way that we operate and what we actually do, which is different in this space, which is fairly crowded now with startups, is that we. We perform our uh, analysis during uh, diagnostic examination, which means that that the results start ticking in and we can actually influence the workflow and adapt the protocol by which the diagnostic examination is performed to uh, to improve efficiency, reduce unnecessary data, uh, and basically speed up uh, the the and 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 prioritize acute uh, findings to those that are not acute and speed up and, and improve the patient uh, journey. Um, we we uh, we went through proof of concept. We've gone through clinical validation. We did the CE mark, and then literally, that was actually two weeks before the Corona lockdown. We were ready to move to a product launch in Vienna at the European Congress of Radiology. And here it was really nice to be part of the health tech hub because uh, because we felt you know the whole rush of of being part of a community. You could see meeting interesting stakeholders that were that were passed through with uh, with the health tech hub. Uh, to help us on that journey. But of course, the corona outbreak uh, and pandemic uh, stopped everything. All our implementations and workshops were halted and postponed. Um, and, and in discussing also with the Health Tech Hub and, and some of our other partners in the, in the network, um, we actually decided not to pivot, but to expand our current brain MRI technology into, uh, into looking at how to risk help risk stratification in healthcare. For uh, for especially Corona patients and during epi ep epidemics and pandemics, uh, to uh, to uh, support the resource allocation for intensive care, for for respiratory support, etc., in healthcare, and are are looking to further develop that now with local hospitals and, and implement that after a CE schedule for about a month ahead. Um, so we're really excited about that. We also in this period, the same period actually, we're just starting our seed fund. A seed raise, uh, which of course I think most who are, have tried fundraising, this is also, I think one of my main sleepless nights uh, issues is uh, is fundraising during Corona, <laughs> is is not easier than before. Um, we saw also some of the large, really interesting healthcare uh, focused investors from, for instance, Germany and Switzerland and Austria, uh, moving away from supporting seed to to support their existing portfolios, etc. 
but uh, but it seems that we have actually made it uh, uh, through that uh, despite uh, the challenges uh, in that. I don't know if you're going to get some numbers in there, yes, but but I'm pretty sure that there has been a drop, especially a drop in investment in pre-revenue early stage companies like ours. But we are we are full of enthusiasm. We have uh, excellent traction with hospitals and healthcare. We get great support here from the Health Hub, channeling in contacts not just in the region but also with uh, internationally with investors with foreign ministry working together hand in hand with the health tech hub and it's been a great stay and i'm looking forward to our next place wherever that's going to be in in about six months when we have to move out of this building but uh, but looking forward for the journey together and and uh, and to uh, be part of it thanks a lot thanks thanks robert for sharing all that uh, that was good. Almost five minutes. Uh, and Ulrich, now it's your turn. So if you can turn the video around, then uh, then the biggest challenge for you as well. Five minutes to present to yourself and some of these. Uh, please uh, answer some of the questions we we said to you. Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, just very briefly, uh, Injury Map uh, is an exercise app uh, that was uh, founded by me together with the. Uh, two of my old friends uh, some years ago. Um, we were basically inspired by the language app called the uh, Duolingo and uh, some knowledge that we had from working with different prototypes, all under the name of Injury Map. Um, we realized that uh, in physical rehabilitation, as with learning a language, you need to start with basic exercises and then gradually move on to something that's more challenging um, and as with Duolingo, we would be able to find out what are, what are your key challenges. Uh, so, for instance, if you need if you need to work on your abdominal muscles more than you need to work on another part of the body, we could use a feedback mechanism to find that out for you. Um, and it turned out that it worked uh, quite well. Uh, so. Uh, we decided to go on and, and joined up with two uh, rheumatologists, actually, also working with a whole other part of rheumatology, uh, as uh, Meta mentioned, that, that you do as well. Um, uh, this is the part that is focused on, of course, muscle and joint pain, such as lower back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, and so on, um, which accounts for actually about 15% of the US healthcare budget when you include uh, all kinds of costs related to that. So it's a huge uh, issue. And the big issue around that is, of course, getting people to do the right things uh, since doing uh, these kinds of uh, targeted exercises at home is not typically preferred over other options, uh, such as you know watching TV, cooking, or whatever. Uh, so that's what we're trying to get people to do. And um, uh, so the best uh, decision that we made over the last uh, 12 months, uh, it's like it, it goes together. It was updating our brand design and story. And then after doing that, focusing on digital marketing. Uh, and I think as a, as, an, as a digital solution that wants to change people's habits, it's really, really important that we just excel at the way that we present our solution and the story that we convey to people. So we, after having worked on a previous uh, version of the app, the first version for some years, we decided the app to what you can see on this screen, or we upload, up, updated the app to what you can see here on this screen. If you go to our website, uh, injurymap.com, you can see a short video that that gives you a better introduction to what the app is. Um, and that was a great decision. Then we also decided to focus 100% on digital marketing direct to the consumer, uh, which was also a really good decision um, for us. Um, and I think that you know, as a digital health startup, you can you can you can try to sell your product across so many different platforms uh, that if you're a small team, that can be a bit much to to handle at the same time. So for us, focusing on one that we thought was the most promising has been an, an awesome thing to do. Uh, so, so we're really learning quickly and, and delivering some, some great results. Um, then um, the biggest uh, challenge uh, has been handling uh, the COVID-19. Um, actually, it hasn't really impacted us adversely, uh, but it ended up doing it anyway because uh, we did a free access campaign where we wrote in all the app store, both of the app stores, Apple's and Google's app store, 
that we were giving free access because of COVID-19. And Google did not like that, so they just shut down the app without asking us. Uh, it's like a, a part of their general uh, risk management uh, uh, in uh, during the crisis, uh, where they just wanted to avoid any distractions from, uh, from, from essential information or anyone taking advantage uh, of uh, the crisis. Of course, that's what we were doing. We were just trying to help out by giving free access to the app for a couple of months, but Google did not care so much about that. So we really realized uh, how dependent we are on these large players, uh, especially Google, Facebook, Apple. It's 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 very serious how important they are for an app developer. Not surprisingly, when you come to think about it, but important to keep in mind. Um, and then finally. Um, being a member at Health Tech Hub Copenhagen, it's really, I mean, it's helping us in a lot of ways. Um, one is that we are very involved in, uh, as an, in, in the debate surrounding the use of apps in the Danish healthcare system, and that is really moving forward a lot. Uh, and Health Tech Hub Copenhagen has been a great supporter, uh, both with uh, setting up events and, and helping us get access to key um, uh, influences um, politicians and so on. So that has been a lot of fun and 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 really is starting to show some results. But then also, I mean, inside the hub here, if we have questions regarding, uh, you know, regulations or digital marketing, even we can talk to each other. And 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 actually, one of our success stories here was that we we reduced uh, the custom acquisition cost from uh, uh, digital marketing by 50% with the help of um, a colleague from another startup called Linus. And uh, so, uh, and you'll hear more from them now, I think. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thank so, you, Mike. Great story. Uh, and thanks for almost keeping me uh, six minutes. That was pretty good. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so, Theodore. Uh, okay. Hey, there you are, Theodore. Hello, hello, everyone. Hi. Good to see you. Okay, I'm going to get started. I'm. Um, Theodore, a technical partner in Linus eHealth. And uh, a brief introduction of us. Um, we're an eHealth uh, scale up. We're building a platform for uh, personal trainers. Um, we are enabling personal trainers to cater to more clients with uh, higher quality. Basically, we are disrupting the, the fitness industry in a sense um, where we are enabling the coaches to reach a new level of scalability. Uh, and increasing the degree of personalization, both through diet and workout plans. Um, as we started this journey, uh, we have realized that many, many different niches of the coaching business needs to be catered to, to be a full-fledged and successful system for, for personal trainers. Um, this means that we, we take care of the full life cycle from getting the leads, converting them to clients, creating the constant feedback loop with the clients afterwards to make sure that all the content sent to the end users are continually adjusted uh, by the coach. Our overall philosophy is that we want to empower the coach uh, and emphasize their ability to take informed decision based on data uh, and send personal content to their users. And as an example, we want to, for example, emphasize that they send personal video messages to the end users instead of wasting time ca um, calculating calories in, in different meal plans. So this is uh, this is our overall goal. Uh, we are active in several markets. Our headquarter is here in Copenhagen. We also have an office in Stockholm and in London, and we are looking into further uh, international expansion. Um, what is also important to understand uh, about our business model is that it's not just a software product, but we also have a consultancy leg. Uh, we quickly realized that coaches using our software, this was the software was simply not enough alone, but um, attaching them to a key account manager, which is, you can say, a growth hacker or an industry specialist from the fitness industry, could help them accelerate their business. Because many of them are charismatic, good on camera, good at working out, but not experienced at scaling a business using KPIs and so forth to drive it. So with that being said, uh, I want to address the three questions. The first one is the best decision uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, this was a hard one to pick, but I still think that, that one thing stands out, and that is our relentless focus on hiring. Uh, we're just 
realized that bringing the right people on board in a timely manner is crucial to our success. And that is across all departments, both from software engineering to key account management, marketing and onboarding. Uh, and this takes time and effort and a lot of resources. Um, we have approached the hiring by a strategy of delegating responsibility to the, the managers throughout the organization to create a higher degree of uh, both autonomy and also focus um, so we don't run into any bottlenecks in terms of hiring across across the board. This of course relies on a very shared uh, vision and mission uh, across the board, which I think we, ha we have achieved for this to, to work. We've also experimented with different strategies, also using external recruiters, kind of finding our own way in the jungle of recruitment. And I think now we have ended up with a blend of using external resources to do some of the legwork and then also quite a high degree of us getting involved. One of the keys uh, we find for successful hires is to involve as many uh, of the uh, of the coming colleagues to evaluate the, the new potential colleague. Uh, that gives a much better fit when, uh, when the match is right. Um, yes. Okay, so the next question is what did, did not go so well? Um, I think as our organization has grown quite tremendously, uh, we have started introducing some organizational structures to, to keep things streamlined and, and work coherently together. And I think this has to some extent also come at the expense of some of our uh, vibrant startup energy, you can say. Uh, and this is very, you need to pay very uh, careful attention to this because you can very quickly become a, a slow corporate monolith. Uh, so it was kind of um, uh, attacking our, our DNA in, in some sort. Uh, and we have really tried to foster a lot of initiatives to bring this energy back, both through like Friday bars and parties, but also going on trips with the teams and also again, creating the autonomy on the teams to, to do uh, small trips and events, uh, because sometimes do, doing everything together in a big organization can be uh, like a showstopper for many events. Um, so we are focusing a lot of on this, and I think it all comes down to the uh, acknowledgement of people is the driving force and, and delegating out responsibility is the way to go. So lastly, speaking about uh, Health Tech Hub, we think it's fantastic being in a group of companies with a, with a shared vision. Uh, I, I think it's important also to to highlight some some individuals and in, in particular you, you Jesper. It's fantastic working together with a, a visionary, the the founding father of this organization that can can uh, help show us the the, the path uh, in this industry. And and we have uh, used a vast uh, array of the resources across Health Tech Hub. Um, it has also helped us uh, being a member here to to communicate our vision in a more coherent manner because we can express how we belong here together and cater to a common mission and a common goal. Um, and that, that really helps us define define our mission. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Theo, for all the nice words and, and great learnings uh, you shared with us as well. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And, and now I will give the word to Thomas Monsenso. If you have not heard the name Monsenso, uh, then uh, you've not seen the news for uh, the last few weeks. Monsenso is the first startup in the Health Tech Hub Copenhagen that will have an IPO very soon. So uh, yeah, you, today he's in Burson. He was there last week many times as well. So Thomas, please take it away from here. Thank you. Let me know if the voice breaks up because I had some issues uh, along along the way. Voice is fine. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, also speak here. Uh, as you say, it's been a, a few hectic weeks, and it's going to be a few hectic weeks in the uh, in the couple of weeks to come. If we look back, uh, for those of you who don't know what Monsenso is, uh, and thanks to Meta for pointing out the importance of uh, anxiety, depression, or mental health. Uh, in the aftermath of uh, COVID-19, because what we're doing is mobile health for mental health. So ba basically trying to help bring better mental health to more people at lower costs. And if we look back at the last uh, 12 months, um, what we're mostly proud of, you can say, is that we have um, succeeded in uh, getting some scalable both customer and partnerships, uh, partnership cases in place. So customers like uh, Regan H, who is now implementing our solution across 
uh, all their psychiatric centers for bipolar patients, for instance. We've um, made a framework agreement with a multinational uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, we last year did a very su successful pilot with them in Germany. We now have orders in three other countries and we're currently negotiating another five countries to be, uh, be included in projects with them. That's in the real world evidence uh, space and adjunct to medication space. We have a uh, Australian, uh, British uh, psychology, private psychology practice who is uh, extending their psychology practice by using our solution to also be able to provide data-driven remote consultations for, uh, for their clients. And, and there we're moving into the workplace mental health, uh, student mental health, and also um, unemployment or employability space. Uh, so that's quite exciting for us. Uh, we made significant progress in our research projects. We are a company that is based originally out of a research project. We continue to be involved in uh, international research projects. Uh, and we are, for instance, rolling out now a, a project for 2,400 students uh, in UK, Germany, Spain, and Belgium. It's the first time we do anything that is patient or individual only. So far, it's always been a connection between clinician and patient. We've um, expanded our geographic coverage, so we're now in nine countries. Uh, and we did some great product improvement last year as well. And we had our first profitable year in 2019. And obviously, we also made the decision to list the company at NASDAQ First North Denmark. Not only did we make the decision, but we also uh, decided to stick to the decision despite COVID-19. Um, and, and for the reasons that Meta were, uh, were emphasizing before, uh, COVID-19 is uh, in the midterm, long term, just going to be positive. Because what we have seen, and we also saw that last year, that some of the research projects pilots that we were involved in, despite very good results, all pointing towards the, the, uh, the fact that this should be implemented uh, in a larger scale, uh, then it doesn't always happen. And that has been due to some reluctance with, uh, in the clinical uh, uh, implementation uh, or among clinicians to implement it. So change management is key for implementation success for us. Um, I also think we learned in the in the last year that we had to move out of Health Tech Hub Copenhagen, so we are a virtual member. I think both Jesper, Valentin, uh, Annette, and myself uh, can look at ourselves and say, being virtual, uh, we, we need to work more uh, to really experience uh, or sharing experiences with the other members if you're not there. And we need to do more of more of an effort to get us back into Health Tech Hub Copenhagen in the coming year. Yes, uh, uh, that was good. Good closing, Thomas. Thanks yeah. a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, that was very. Uh, thanks all of you for taking the time to just share five minutes. I know it's difficult because you're so passionate and have uh, many things that you want to share. Uh, we'll link to your web page, uh, all of you's uh, web page, and it has done that while you uh, while you spoke. So. Uh, so if you want to hear more about these startups, please link to them. And, but you can also ask questions, obviously, in the dialogue. Uh, we are a little bit after uh, schedule. So I will give the word now to, to Valentin, uh, who will talk a little bit about the future of health. And then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. So Valentin, yes, I can see your slides now. So if you can continue. I can see your Yes. Okay. Maybe again, do you okay. Yes. Yes. Take it from here. Okay.
Okay. So it was nice to hear uh, to hear all the positive uh, all the positive words about Helter Cup Copenhagen as well. It says if it's our birthday today. Uh, I'm gonna speak in the next uh, 15, 16 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna say a few words about where we see the future of health going and the future of health tech. And uh, I was asked to do this so that uh, if this doesn't come true, you know who to blame as well. Um, before going and uh, speaking about the future of health tech, um, we need to, to look uh, at the few um, major shifts uh, that are happening in health, which uh, give the context uh, in which most health tech companies operate. And one of the and one of the biggest the the first uh, the first shift that is has been happening for for some time, but very slowly now. It's been the transition from sick care to healthcare, and that is um, that our healthcare systems have been built uh, on keeping us alive and uh, on uh, on uh, giving us longevity. But as this has uh, started happening, we also started realizing that there's more to that, and that quality of life is very important. Um, and we started seeing people. Uh, not wanting to take uh, to take certain medication that would pro prolong their life. Instead, uh, they chose to have a better quality of life, but a shorter one. Now, uh, moving towards a health uh, a healthcare system means that a lot more attention will be given on prevention and on uh, us not uh, not. On, on, a lot of focus will be on us not getting sick uh, because uh, there is no one who is sick uh, who considers that their sickness increases their quality of life. Now, the next uh, the next major shift, um, and this is related to the one above, is uh, uh, where does the health happen? Um, and while for hundreds of years it has been happening around institutions, um, and around the, the, the medical professionals, for obvious reasons of physical limitations, right now uh, and in the future, health is happening anywhere. Um, it's happening anywhere around us because we have the possibility uh, to. We, we have the possibility uh, to self manage and do something about our health at any anywhere we are and at any time we want. Um, and that brings me talking to the, about the next uh, big shift and that is that uh, health is becoming from, from being periodic to being continuous. We're used to going uh, to, the, uh, to the doctor and getting our blood pressure checked. And if we had a bad day and uh, argued with someone in the parking lot is going to be really high and we're going to, everybody's going to assume that our blood pressure is high. Now uh, we are able to monitor this ourselves and make correlations and connections um, and see what is it, what are the triggers uh, that uh, are slowly pushing us uh, towards sickness and do something about them. Um, and all of this has an effect on the business models of the healthcare system. Which is uh, which is now cost based, and uh, it uh, looks at indicators such as number of beds, uh, number of uh, the the medication, uh, the the number of uh, of medicine that we use, and how much does this cost, and number of doctors, and number of nurses, etc. But it doesn't look at at the outputs and what happens outside of the institutions. And there's this is a trend that Mette also mentioned that it's been, we've been talking about this for quite some time, uh, but we see this uh, accelerating because the system is not built uh, to be sustainable. And as it is, it cannot be scaled. Uh, no matter how many more doctors and more, more medication you, you bring, you are not going to be able to, uh, to do, uh, to, 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 to keep in, uh, in line with uh, everyone living longer. Uh, 
the World Economic Forum said that in 2040 there won't be any more hospitals, that all care is going to, to happen at home. I think the good news is that hospitals are still going to be around, uh, but they're going to have a different business model and they're going to have a different purpose. And the fifth uh, large um, shift that, uh, that we will see is that from uh, a generic health system to a personalized system. And right now, we are in a world where uh, women are 50 to 70 more, 70 percent more likely to have adverse events uh, from uh, from medication, uh, because for a very long time, everybody that uh, participated, the majority of people that participated in uh, in, in clinical studies were men. Uh, so we're we are at a stage where we are not even personalized based on the two biggest population groups in the world that you can find in every country, let alone uh, personalized on an individual level. And that is changing, and that is changing with the help of technology and because we are able to to monitor it and get much, much more data uh, uh, from uh, from from each individual and use it use it well. Now, there are a lot of uh, smarter, wiser, and uh, one of them uh, even taller people than myself that uh, talk about the future of health quite a bit. And uh, I recommend all of them and I'm best because I like them as well. So please check them out. But what, where does that leave uh, health tech? Now, for a, for a very long time, we've been talking, we've been looking into the future and we've been looking at 10 years, five years or 30 year uh, time horizons. But I think that uh, during this, uh, this pandemic, we also proved to ourselves that we can do things much, much faster, faster if we have the right incentives. So what do we see? Uh, where do we see health tech in 2024? or even in the presentation that I had on my computer, it's just 2022. Um, we, see it, uh, we see it answering and challenging a lot of the existing evidence that is, uh, that is out there because of the data that, is, uh, that Health Tech is, is creating, individualized data, and also because uh, Health Tech can make much better use of data uh, than we were have been able to do uh, as individuals and uh, behind uh, behind desks in in universities, crunching numbers uh, at a completely different scale. That means also there is going to be a huge empowerment of individuals that we are already and we are already seeing this. Uh, people are not waiting uh, for. Uh, uh, for for all the hell to come uh, to come from. Uh, medical professionals but they are taking uh, they are taking health into their own hands because they can now what we're also going to to see uh, is that uh, health tech has been attracting has attracted a lot more doctors and nurses and paramedics etc uh, who chose to become entrepreneurs and that happened in 2024 because somewhere around 2020 we realized that uh, it it's not scary uh, to let and encourage uh, medical professionals to become entrepreneurs. Uh, because instead of thinking that we are losing a doctor from the system, uh, we realize that we should be seeing that uh, that doctor has now the ability to exponentially reach a lot more people and spread their knowledge uh, and empower a lot, uh, a lot more individuals that otherwise uh, they, they, they couldn't have done it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And fourth, uh, the fourth point that uh, we would like very much to see is uh, that uh, health, tech, uh, health tech apps and health tech will be prescribed um, because we have also at this point around 2020, we realized that there is more to uh, a lot more to to health than uh, uh, th than just treatment. Uh, so doctors have started uh, realizing that it makes sense to prescribe injury map, and it makes sense to prescribe Linus and Monsenso to their uh, uh, to their patients because 
it has a much bigger impact on quality of life uh, than the current situation, which is waiting until they do need uh, something. Uh, they do need a pill because of sickness. There are also a couple of things that we don't see in 2024, and that and one of those is borders. We realized during the pandemic in 2020 that um, good solutions uh, and technology can be implemented remotely from anywhere in a very short amount of time, and it can be localized, and it will have the same effects as if it would have been implemented locally uh, from someone that whose face you see and who you are able to touch you, you shouldn't uh, unless you know them anyway uh, what we are also not going to see is uh, pilots uh, because for the past uh, uh, for the past 10 years we also realized that pilots have become a barrier for adoption because they have become projects in themselves and they are not being designed with scalability in mind, uh, and this has only delayed uh, the, delayed the adoption. And the last thing that we're not going to see anymore is closed systems, because we also realize that with the user at the center and with us uh, at the center of uh, of care, we are uh, we we need to provide as health tech. We need to provide a seamless uh, experience and an integrated one, uh, because otherwise. Uh, the users will not uh, will not use our solutions. They do not want to have 16 different apps uh, that uh, that they will use at the same time. But they will ha want to to have uh, a certain level of integration between them that reflects their life, which is not uh, segmented. Now, uh, one of the things that we are also going to see is that the time spent on uh, on adopting health tech, uh, health tech solutions uh, changes. This is uh, pretty much how it uh, how it looks now. Uh, there is most of the time being is being spent on doubt. Um, a big part of the time is being spent uh, on looking for. Uh, for funding and for money and for reimbursement, and very little time is spent on actual adoption and implementation. How we see it, uh, how we see it in the future is that um, this this is going to change dramatically. Uh, the big focus will be on designing this for sustainability, um, designing the the implementation for sustainability and scalability. Co-designing it with your uh, with your partners and uh, and your collaborators, and start uh, starting to roll uh, and adapting continuously uh, during uh, during that period. And why did this shift happen in 2024 uh, or or even earlier? It is still because in 2020 we had a pandemic. Uh, and with everything that it brought, uh, and um, all the all, all the hardship that that it brought, it also opened our eyes that uh, made us see that we are able to do uh, to provide health better, faster, and to more people, um, and make decisions much quicker than than we were used to uh, while uh, in uh, in the early early 2000s uh, it would take over three years to have a telemedicine uh, platform implemented and a few other years afterwards uh, without it being scaled um, in 2020 during a pandemic in, in Denmark it was implemented in six weeks uh, our uh, our whole mindset has uh, has has shifted uh, during during that time uh, towards uh, towards speed, um, and also during that time, we made a pledge that um, we are going to work closer to each other, and we are going to do more with each other and for each other, in order to reach this uh, this vision. Um, and luckily, there was. Uh, there was a place uh, then where everybody could come together. 
um, and they could work together towards uh, uh, towards towards concrete collaborations. Um, and every time a uh, large organization, whether it's a hospital, a uh, an, an industry or organization, or a region, um, would come and start discussing about uh, about uh, collaborating with a uh, with a small innovative uh, um, innovative company and the question uh, would come into play uh, the the question that would be on the table would be how long will it uh, will it take to do this it would be uh, unacceptable to have a different answer uh, than uh, that we will do this pandemic fast. Uh, having seen the experiences of what we can achieve, um, this is uh, this this is the momentum that uh, that we need to to keep and we need to we, we need to push uh, push forward together. Um, and as a uh, as a young company uh, coming to the hub, uh, all you needed uh, all you needed to do is. Uh, to focus on building uh, and building and keeping a high quality in uh, in your products, and building a strong team, um, and keeping uh, keeping your ethics and having high ambitions uh, that that are global. And if that that would be the case, you would know that you would get the right support here, the right intelligence. Um, you would uh, get links to. To the best partners out there, and um, you would have access to smart money uh, because also at the end of 2020, uh, the Health Tech Hub Copenhagen will have raised uh, a uh, will have raised a fund uh, that is there to support uh, the most ambitious uh, and most impactful uh, companies. Uh, in the hub in the and in the Danish eco ecosystem. Now, what we would uh, what we will also see uh, uh, during during those days is that more and more pitch decks uh, will have a uh, an exit point, not will have as as exit point not to be uh, to be acquired by uh, by big industry but to become big industry. And that uh, will be a time when uh, we would well, when we will be very proud to still be there along uh, the, these companies and lift them up and help them scale and help them become uh, the next uh, the next large tech companies or the next uh, uh, in, in line with the la large tech companies or the next life science companies now th this is uh, this is the ambition that uh, that uh, keeps us uh, that ma makes us come to work every day and this is the fire that is burning within uh, within all of us and this is why we started this uh, uh, we started this hub, and every time we see someone else that is uh, has has the same fire in their eyes and has uh, the same drive, we try to do something together. Whether it's uh, they become our new colleagues, or our new partners, um, or our new members, we get closer together and and start collaborating. And in uh, in those lines, uh, also we're also quite excited to announce uh, to have a small announcement. Uh, it's a, a very fresh uh, out of uh, out of the oven announcement, but one that are, we are very proud of, and that is uh, our new partnership with uh, Nordic Health Lab and uh, North Zealand Hospital. That is focusing on fast tracking adoption testing and evidence uh, and this is happening because these uh, the people that uh, that we have met from there and Rune I believe is also on the on the call now have this fire in their eyes and uh, are impatient 
and know that we can do things faster while keeping a high level of quality. Thank you for listening. And uh, we're going to have a, a quick uh, Q&A uh, session now. And I'm going to end this with a, uh, with a flying question that uh, I invite you to take home uh, as well. You don't need to answer now. We'd be very eager to hear some of the answers now. And that is, what can your what can you and your organization do uh, to contribute uh, to, to reaching this vision if this is something that you believe in? And uh, I'm yeah, passing, passing, it on. On. I'm passing the mic to you. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Valentin. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks all, uh, all of you. Some great uh, inspiration, great thoughts. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, I, I just uh, we have five minutes for questions. So if you have other last questions, please uh, write them in the Q and A sessions. I will just uh, finish up by just reflecting. We had a few technical issues. I hope you bear with that. It will also be recorded, so if there's anything you missed, maybe it's better on the recording. Uh, we had two polls around the way uh, where we asked if you thought that you would see more demand for health tech after COVID-19. And the ones of you who answered said yes. And the ones of you who answered as well saying that you, if you saw more demand for your services actually right now. And the answer was also yes. So that was very positively to say so. Uh, one question who, which came. Uh, was that what can we learn from the other Nordic countries? And uh, and I think uh, we're, we're fairly new in this health tech Nordic, but it, there's no doubt that the Swedes, our friends just across the water, uh, they're doing very well. And they're doing very well in terms, and I just want to highlight one thing where they're doing well. They First of all, they have a, a lot of startups that have been working in health tech for a long time, and they have some very good events as well around these. Um, and they have been pretty good from the government's perspective to actually do reimbursement very fast. So that's also one of the reasons that they have one of the startups called Cru, uh, which is uh, uh, it's a, a GP as a service kind of a company is doing extremely well because they have been reimbursed from the beginning. And uh, they're also taking these uh, telemedicine uh, things through the roof at, uh, under COVID but they are also exporting it to other countries. So we've seen some, some companies in Sweden that has had tremendous growth, and I think we can learn from that in Denmark. And also, if anyone uh, would like to learn more about the US market, I'm more than happy to jump on a call and, and answer any questions you have. Yes, thanks, Meta, for that offer. Uh, I just got another uh, question here. Uh, will, will your new partners function as possible customers as well? That was a good. Uh, that was a good question, Margareta. And, yeah. and uh, we hope so. But that's uh, we will obviously work on that as well. Thanks for that. And as you say, we're doing this together in the health technology spirit. Any any other questions? Comments? All right. Then, then I want to uh, thank you all for listening in, staying tuned for 90 minutes. That was uh, impressive on a Friday afternoon. Uh, we will send out the, a link to, to it online. So if you don't, can't find anything on, the, on your favorite Netflix or HBO channels tonight, you can stream it again and share it with your friends and family on social media. And we'll also send you the slides as well if there's anything you, you like to pick up from there. Feel free to reach out to us as well with a follow-up question. And if there's a question that we have not answered, then we'll get back to you as well. We have your name here as well. So thanks a lot and have a fantastic weekend, all of you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.